Hey everyone, this is Alec from Reddit's Hex Encounter community. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're resuming some of our streaming and this time doing a Q&A panel discussion, if you will, on the systems involved in the Next War series by GMT Games. Uh, the two Next War players that are going to be fielding questions and talking about the systems are myself, Alec, and my guest for today, uh, Vice Roy Gage. Gage, thanks for joining Hey, Alec. Glad to be here and uh, looking forward to attempting to get some next war done. I say attempting because I'll be playing the, the Chinese today and they start in a position that is uh, not necessarily enviable. It's uh, moving a lot of armored units through a lot of jungle. Uh, indeed. Uh, and so with, with that, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and kind of get into this. As you can see, we've got the... Uh, chat going there from uh, the Discord, and we've got a few people joining us here live uh, that uh, will maybe tossing some questions or just really fielding discussion. I don't know how much of a full turn we're going to you know, get through here. Uh, really, that's kind of secondary, uh, getting that discussion of the systems. And, and really, for me, discussion of abstraction at uh, appropriate levels of warfare. Um, a, a lot of new people coming into wargaming from board gaming see the systems and and can you know read a rule book and and you know try and mechanistically go through a procedure and and, and of course often war game procedures are somewhat daunting uh, compared to some of the you know really sleek trimmed rule sets from the euro gaming communities um, uh, but one thing that you know kind of gets lost on that um, formulaic look at, at wargaming is the intuition on just what is being modeled, what's happening here. And I think Next War, kind of maybe more than anything, is is kind of tried and true to the operational land warfare genre and a lot of the conceits that have been really deep in the hobby, um, things such as terrain effects charts, um, uh, combat results tables, um, uh, zones of control, uh, lines of supply, these things really are abstractions of real world systems that affect combat operations. And so having a discussion on, on kind of how those fit and, and to clarify uh, can maybe help people that are new to the system that are just trying to get going. And, and I suppose I'll just throw out there, um, you know, one or two thoughts as we get going, and then I'll turn the mic over to Gage to, to you know, give it uh, any thoughts that he has. Um, but if, if you are new to the Next War system, if you are new to Wargaming or new to Next War, and you're worried that you're going to get something wrong, stop. Don't give up the worry. You are going to get something wrong. It's going to happen. Uh, and that's by design, right? Um, in, in my sense, you know, these games are, are meant to be enjoyed and not perfected. And experience and a uh, understanding opponent are really kind of, you know, the, the, the best pair in doing so. So using a familiarization with the sequence of play, uh, a familiarization with the structure of the rulebook, patience on being willing to go and look up a rule when something when the resolution isn't immediately apparent at the table and then using some you know uh, honest intuition and judgment to keep the game moving are really my personal um, recommendations to uh, keep a game flowing and enjoy a game system even if it's new or as meaty here as next tour um, so so we'll kind of frame the discussion uh, in that and, and kind of hopefully get uh, anyone who's watching enough where they can feel comfortable uh, uh, going at it. Um, before we start uh, fielding questions, Gage, any um, introductory comments from you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you've already nailed it. I would just add that this game is daunting, but it is, it is definitely conquerable. It is, if you, if you take it bite by bite and learn each little bit, it all flows together pretty naturally once you understand it but it takes it takes a bit to get that understanding all right and with that um unless you have something else there gage um nope good to go okay so with that uh, i'll take the first question that someone left for in the chat you know of course being a, a global community of war gamers um you know uh, 8 p.m eastern time u.s is not necessarily uh, on a wednesday is not necessarily ideal for everyone to drop what they're doing and catch a stream. So someone did, um, Baron did drop a question for us to uh, pick up when we get doing this, and and he wanted to have some clarifications on Zonk and Ezok, or or zones of control and enemy zones of control, 
um, uh, as they're involved through the various movement segments. Um, uh, and, you know, he brings up a, a, a good question here. Um, that there are some different interpretations of the finer points of the rules, and and you know we can leave that be as far as what what some of the finer points are, um, but but what are some of the broad brush um, uh, core combat conceits that Zok and Izak are trying to get at, Gage? So the big reason why you would want to have zone of control or Izak or represented in game is to show a lot of the friction. Um, Warfare is as much about finding the enemy as it is about fighting them, if not more so. So when the enemy is nearby, uh, especially at the scale we're looking at here, which is uh, brigade up, you're getting indicators that they're nearby. Uh, maybe your, your recon units are running into their recon units, you're getting into small-scale fights, or they're able to range you with artillery that prevents you from being able to move the way you want. At the same time, they're not able to decisively engage you because that takes more effort. They can't bring a lot of their soldiers to bear or a lot of their weapon systems to bear. They can only bring a few things at a time in a few different areas. So the zone of control rules sort of show that, that this is how far a unit could project some of its power out in order to prevent you from doing what you want. The big counterbalance to a zone of control, I think, is freedom of maneuver. If you think of freedom of maneuver, the ability to move the way you want, with as many units as you need to, the zone of control is what infringes upon that. It stops you from being able to do that. It takes away some of that freedom, not because of what is literally there, but because what could be there if the enemy decides to do that. And as far as getting back to the intuition here for, for folks, it just gets to that, right? The abstraction that we are seeing here, if I zoom in on this one unit, you know, the um, uh, S... Uh, um, uh, SRV, uh, 2nd Corps, 304th Division, right, um, which is mechanized here. This counter with those numbers on it represents, this is a division, right? This represents, um, you know, uh, thousands of, of, you know, combat um, personnel, support personnel, vehicles, equipment, etc., right? And so this hex right here where the counter sits on the layer abstraction of this map um, you know, uh, it, you know, maybe X number of miles across, but really this, this is an abstraction to where is the center of gravity physically of that combat, uh, unit. And, but extending beyond that are the areas that they are able to hold at risk and, and areas that they're able to sense and, and get going at here. So we, what we, we have a very clean look here on this map of a very discreet counter, right? But what that is trying to abstract for us is is this very amorphous, nebulous thing with lots of subunits and lots of independent uh, elements. And depending on what country you're looking at, right, the various elements may or ha have more or less autonomy than others, right? This maybe in World War II systems get, gets you back to seeing the German units represented at the divisional scale, uh, but whereas the Russian units are represented at the core scale, right? You know, oftentimes in these games, you'll see... Um, the maneuver units represented at the smallest level that is a maneuver unit. You notice here that we've got some brigades, um, you know, that are about to just crush my outpost at Dong Dang. Um, uh, but uh, uh, so we, we have this this thing on, on zones of control. So getting into the gamisms of it, um, you know, what is it that zones of control do? They, they stop adversary movement or significantly increase the cost of it. Um, uh, and different games that are operational scale will do this different ways, right? Some of them will have increased cost in movement points to enter the terrain. Some will have diff increased cost in movement points to exit ter the terrain. Some will cause a full stoppage of movement upon entering a ZOC. Then you have the interactions with other systems, such as determining lines of supply or, or communication uh, for victory conditions or for supply. You know, of course, you don't necessarily want to be running your convoys of soft vehicles um, uh, um, through areas where the enemy is holding things at risk. Um, however, that being said, one could argue that recent uh, U.S. combat experience in Iraq and Afghanistan is a, is a counterpoint to that. Um, you'll note, though, uh, if you look at the, those conflicts, that was actually the point where a lot of the conflict happened, was attacking those supply lines. All right, so that, that gets us on Zok and Izok. 
um, from the folks that are either in the chat with us or, or on audio on the stream. Any of you have any questions you want to throw out or should we just start discussing our thinking here as we go through the setup and first sets of uh, uh, segments on this uh, turn in the game? <laughs> All right, I see we have a vote here in the chat to just press on. Um, open rules here. If you've got something that you want to stop and bring up for discussion, uh, type it into chat. Or if you're in here in the, the stream with us, go ahead and, and interject and, uh, and uh, throw some things out there. I'll um, briefly back out for all of you um, to show you uh, the map at a scale that is useful here. This is the entirety of the map. And, and I guess, actually, I'll take a very brief pause because a few folks that were um, uh, new to the server to catch the stream or caught some of this on, on Twitter um, were, were actually uh, discussing a general unfamiliarity with Vassal. And particularly here in an era of social distancing, I wholeheartedly encourage all of you who haven't already done so to pick up and become familiar with Tabletop Simulator and pick up and become familiar with Vassal, as this will be the way that you can get your game to the table. Or, you know, it doesn't even have to be coronavirus. If you have a cat, get Vassal. <laughs> uh, you know, those, those things are tornadoes for stacks of chits uh, left unattended. Uh, so, so um, you know, Vassal is is just a platform. There's no rules enforcement whatsoever, and um, some publishers are much better at others about supporting content creators making modules so that we can do this, right? People can stream the games or people can play it um, w without having to physically get there uh, with one another. So um, there will be some things here in Vassal that I'll show you, some that I won't uh, because regrettably uh, I'm not able to stream the windows that pop out uh, given how I'm streaming this, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll discuss them. Um, so I am playing uh, the Vietnamese player. Uh, you'll notice uh, if, if we can zoom in here on the uh, compass rondel that this, uh, you know, oddly uh, is um, a uh, map that's canted, right? Uh, and so that's one kind of annoying thing uh, in this game. It, it fits for the game in that it, it allows for maximum use of hex grain and hex features. Um, but uh, the top of the map is northeast. Um, uh, but it's for uh, a notional incursion of um, the People's Republic of China, PRC, into the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, or SRV. Um, and the there's a, uh, a basic game and an advanced game, or standard game and an advanced game. We're going to play the standard game, given that many of the core rules and, and questions on how operational and modern games work are common between them. What you get big changes on are additional rule sets, additional rules burden, or higher fidelity treatment of special cases. Uh, and we can get into an interesting discussion if anyone's interested on strategies that game designers take to treat um, that higher level of fidelity. Um, the way that's been happening in this system is one way to do it, which is to add a lot of rules. Uh, but there are other interesting ways to do it that we can discuss. So um, in the setup here, this is uh, we're, we're restricted to the um, uh, the right part of the map, and uh, I am trying to I, I as the allied player uh, or SRV um, have first setup, and so I have to obey some doctrinal rules, which is the second core is deployed. Um, uh, uh, pretty much anywhere I want or up, up here near the border. I do have um, the first um, military region, uh, you know, Vietnam here is uh, so divided into three military regions that you can see here on the map, 1MR, 2MR, uh, and uh, 2MR, and 3MR. And, um, and so my military region units, such as the third military region units I deployed on the bottom part of the map, first on the top part of the map, and knowing that, of course, the friction is going to be happening at the border, at least initially, uh, I deployed the second core along uh, the border. Um, and the first core is restricted to in the vicinity of Hanoi and Haiphong. Um, my choice here was to kind of lean them as far forward towards the border as I could so I could rapidly reposition them to where they wanted to be. 
Um, you'll, you'll note that we've got uh, three different um, types of roads uh, available to us. Um, you have the highways here or in and around Hanoi, primary roads going out from that, and occasionally these, these uh, secondary roads, and sometimes I'll call them footpaths. Um, they're, they're somewhat useful. Um, really, this will be the entirety of the game for PRC, and I'll let Gage discuss that in, in more detail. My, my next uh, set of deployments, you'll see that I, my third MR, I kind of am leading along the um, this bottom ridge of this wetland area leading to the Gulf of Tonkin. Um, and the um, uh, um, additionally, I've got two of them here on the coast uh, as long as well as one marine armor uh, battalion. So <laughs> this this was done through through prior experience, but I'll, I'll let um, uh, Gage discuss that with uh, his placement and maybe some thoughts on him on on some of his openings. So where we are in the current setup is I have placed my units that are available to me in the scenario and Gage has done likewise. And so what's on to me is to do a setup half move to respond to the arrival of the Chinese forces to the border. Um, but uh, I'll let Gage discuss considerations for his uh, unit placement and what are his thoughts on his opening. Cheers, Alec. Thanks. So this scenario is pretty straightforward. The only victory points that exist are he who holds the most hexes of Hanoi wins. So with that, everything else I'm doing is in service of that idea, how to get to Hanoi. I have two group armies to start with, the 74th and the 83rd. The dividing line is right over, you see the golden helicopter, the 41 column is the dividing line between the two, with 83rd can only be on that column left, and 74th can only be on that column right. The 74th is a lighter unit. Uh, the strongest unit it has, I believe, is an attack four. Oh no, there's one attack six, as opposed to the multiple attack sixes that exist in the 83rd group army. So, I've got kind of an asymmetric start. In addition, over my holding box, I've got several brigades of airborne, six in total, of which I can drop four per turn. Four of them are light infantry, two of them are airborne mech. And then I have two marine brigades, uh, first marine and second marine. Uh, I'll, I'll get to them in a second. In addition, I have attached helicopter units for both group armies. So when I saw how Alec placed his forces, I started to look at what can I use to open up routes to move rapidly towards Hanoi. These gray lines, these are primary roads as discussed, and they're going to be the lifeblood of can I get there. This is only a four-turn scenario, and I will have the initiative for three of those turns, and the fourth one will be whoever has killed more units. The third... The... Uh, and in service of that, though, I get really two chances to act for each of my units, which means a total six to eight, or seven to eight, depending on whether or not I win the initiative on the fourth. So in eight moves, I've got to get as many people to Hanoi as possible. The more I get to Hanoi, the more Alec will likely spread or collapse in all the units that he currently has spread out. So the way I can complicate that picture for him is those airborne units and those marine units. If we can get the uh, the scroll to go down to 4420, the amphibious landing. Terrific. It's down there right next to the uh, next war Vietnam. If you go from the, the hex where the inn is in next war and look two hexes up and to the left, you'll see one hex has an unusual coloring. That's 4420. In this particular scenario, that is the only hex that you can do amphibious landings in. So Alec has reinforced that. But so long as I either don't commit my Marines or commit them there and bog those units down, that's two motor rifle units, one division and one or a motor rifle division and an armored brigade that I can keep bogged down and will not be able to collapse back into Hanoi. I can do similar things when I choose to drop my airborne by choosing to put them somewhere where his units have to react. So with that, those units are really best used for, in my opinion, some kind of shaping effort. It would be difficult based on their strengths to drop them in and directly assault Hanoi because he would be able to rapidly pull in all these surrounding units and quickly overpower me. Having my landing zones overrun on turn one would be highly embarrassing and it would be a loss of units that I would not be able to recover from. So I have to be conscious of that when I'm choosing where to drop. With my two primary group armies, 
the 74th, I looked to overwhelm the 3rd of the 1st motor rifle, which is a division size unit. It's pretty weak. It's a 344. So it's got three offense, four defense. I can overwhelm four defense, even with the sizable jungle bonus that he gets somewhat easily. And then I can ride that secondary road, or correction, that is a primary road, uh, all the way down, and he would have to either move something else to, uh, to extend his Ock, or I would get a lot of freedom maneuver, at least to an extent. If you look, I can go down to the crossroads in 4506 and then take footpaths to Wong B where I could either fight that unit or I could take a little bit more time to go over to the primary in 4208 and then drive to Hanoi from there. With the 83rd, their position is not enviable. This is one of my frustrations with the game, that it doesn't make me dislike the game. It's the scenario as much as anything. Uh, but I'd seen in the, in the chat earlier from Onion Man, I believe, that everything gets piled up at the border. You're sort of stuck with having to, to shovel things in through these main roads. Believe it or not, I think that's good design in a way that it shows the frustrations of people always want to know in, in modern warfare, why doesn't the side with the most tanks win? Like, it seems like it should be that simple as somebody that likes tanks. I tend to like simple aphorisms like that, but they're limited because what you have is only as good as where you can get it. So having all these primo armored and mechanized units bottled up at the border represents a very real problem that just the geography has its own tyranny here. So these guys are going to have to bust through the Dongdang combat outpost in order to get any kind of freedom maneuver to continue moving through Hanoi. So as I stand posed to, to take my first turn, that's what I'm thinking. I'll pause if there's any questions. All right, and I will throw one... Um yellow card on placement on 3904 uh, again getting back to acknowledging and respecting terrain in this game um the, you know this is where their scenario special rules really do come in um you know we we don't expect that a lot of these tanks would have the heavy engineering equipment ahead of them to plow their way off of the improved surfaces into the deep jungle to allow an off-axis attack and so um if you look at um, the um, setup instructions for the PRC, all units set up on the operational map must set up on a highway, primary road, or in a flat terrain hex. There's not a lot of flat terrain hexes in this game. You'll see them popping off like bright white, like the one up here in 3801. That is, that is a flat terrain hex. Pretty much all the other uh, hexes that we deal with here are rough jungle. So um, we'll, we'll and, and like I was saying here, this is where a thing where if, if we had started playing a little bit here and realized that, you know, whatever, <laughs> right, play the game, um, you know, uh, it's, it's an interesting opportunity for us now to look at that and go, oh, yeah, right, that jungle stinks and kind of force him to, to, you know, get those guys a little bit further back in line, if you will. Um, and, and while we look at that, actually, we'll, we'll uh, give us a good opportunity to discuss stacking, right? This is uh, stacking is one of those um game uh, conceits that's common in operational type games uh, and in computer games that try and do these things you, you might see something referred to as frontage right like if you're playing in hearts of iron 4 or if you're playing in war in the east um, and, and this is that these units at combat effic efficiencies take space right uh, you can only bring a certain amount of fire to bear and the enemy has to be within your your line of fire and so you can't bring four combat factors of the uh, 14 um, of the 83rd GA if they're all lumbered on flatbeds on the highway, right? Um, and so this gets us to the concept of stacking, where there's a certain mass of units that you can have coexist and still have combat effectiveness. You're allowed to go beyond that, um, but it's typically then at some penalty, representing the abstraction of there's either now a traffic jam or folks are you know off in a ditch or they're lumbered up on flatbeds uh, in the case of mechanized units or the infantry are, are in the soft uh, troop transport, uh, you know, uh, uh, mass transports, not the armored combat troop transports. Yeah, absolutely. If I can actually own up to uh, more of that, I had gotten so interested in destroying 3-1 motor rifle, I totally ignored that rule for the 74th GA for those three units. They've all got to move too. But again, part of the system, 
a lot of individual rules to keep track of. So I will go ahead and move all my units into compliance. So I think you're fine in 5403 if you want. Do you mean 4503? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, it says have to set up on a highway or primary road. Oh, yep, you're right. Okay. Rain. No, don't don't get me wrong. That's a lovely attacking position, but I, I don't <laughs> think I'm able to enjoy it to start. So just like that, the situation changes a little bit, but you'll see on the first turn, I'll still be able to move basically all my stuff where I want it. It's just going to take a turn of moving into it as opposed to starting there. Well, and so now as I'm looking into my next move, which is which is going to be um, the uh, per the game, uh, it's either setup rule or a game special rule. Yeah, you know, a game special rule eight SSR eight. Um, and so for those of you just getting into this game or the other games, um, other games that are similar to this, pay attention to the SSRs. Um, you know, th th these go all the way back, but these are the little bits of designer specificity in a scenario right where they're able to then tailor the rules to really get at um trying to get it to work the way that's supposed to in their mind and so in this case right you know i set up first because i'm the defender and and you know china when planning their operation would know where i am and so here they all come right like there's there's been some massive military exercise and it's been near the border and some for some reason they're not demobilizing and this is problematic right um and so so now i'm able to go oh wait they've not demobilized and over a couple of days try and get you know units into a better position but but then he jumps so so under this special rule um i can move uh each of my one and two core units half of their ground movement um, i can't destroy bridges or use air transport I can't enter China and Zox don't go into effect across uh, a country border, right? And which makes sense, right? Where we are uh, in the, um, we're, we're not in the, the um, hostility phase yet. And so, so there's nothing inhibiting my freedom of maneuver on my side of the border. Um, so that being said, you know, I, I see, of course, that um, he still has his airborne and he still has his, um, uh, maritime units. I'm slightly concerned about my port at Cam Fa or uh, that airfield, right? Um, if, if he is able to secure a port, um, that means that he will then be able to use sea lift, assuming maritime superiority, which isn't that hard for China and their backyard here, um, to offload troops at the port and bring in the next uh, uh, GA into a port uh, in my side, which is problematic. Um, but I also don't feel I'm, I'm comfortable enough to bring folks up from down here. Um, and, and I kind of have to cover zone defense down here so I can snuff out an airborne wherever they decide to drop. Um, up here in the front, though, given this placement, which, again, shouldn't have been shocking to me that, that they would have ended up here, um, I, I, I've got some concerns, right? And I'm still concerned about 3-1-MR. Um, and I'm concerned based on, you know, this is a lot. This is a fully stacked hex here in 4404, um, 154 and 125 of 74 GA. Um, it would not be awful, and I'd have to check the movement rules, but you know, most games like this allow for minimum moves, and, and you know, depending on the game, you could move within uh, from one Izak to another. Um, some games don't allow that, so I would need to check, but a movement to 40, 4504 of anybody would really kind of wreck my lunch for 3-1 MR, right? Like, if, if we get into hostilities, that guy's kind of out on his own. Um, at the same time, I look over here on my other front and I see the um, Second Corps 325th near Cao Bang, and that guy's far enough out there. I kind of need him out there um, because, you know, there's a whole mess of roads over here uh, that, that an enemy can potentially just blitz through if I don't hold specifically uh, this crossroads or the ones here in 3504. 
Um, but that being said, um, his zone of control only exerts to these six hexes around him, and I got a big gap here. Particularly, um, you know, I, I'm worried about these couple of hexes uh, right here, um, you know, uh, on the hex grain northwest of Dongdang. Uh, where you know he could potentially just start. You know he's not, he's not going to go far. You know, you're not going to if you look at the cost penalties for taking armor through jungle. Uh, it would take him all of his moves just to get out of the jungle, right? Like he he, he actually he would he would still be in the jungle, um, but he can get to a road, right? That is problematic. You know he can eat a move to you know plow into the jungle, eat another move to get to a road, and then he's on a road. So so I, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about this whole. Uh, in my line over here. Now, what do I do about it? <laughs> uh, 3-1 MR is on his own. Uh, he does not benefit from that move. This is a lower efficiency unit. This is a four unit, right? This is kind of more of the uh, garrison type unit um, versus the five or six efficiency two core units. Um, I could move 325 opening the route to Kaobang and that side, which I'm not sure I want to do. I could move um, some of my first core up, which I might do. Um, primary road movement is um, for leg units in good weather, which we are, and we still need to roll for um, gauge. We still need to roll for air points um, once we finish set up here. But um, yeah, it's it's a half movement point to move along a road hex, and so for two move the two movement points I get, for instance, I can move the three uh, three twelve one movement point to here, one movement point to here, and, and have them sit there at uh, uh, Ben Gia, which helps a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit. Trying to figure out if I want 202 to go anywhere, if I want to send anyone out up to help plug 3-1 MR. I might want to, uh, those, those uh, footpaths, if you will, the secondary roads, um, it's one per to move, so I'm not going to get very far using those right now. All right, Onion's asking why not stick them all in the jungle, as in just push all my guys off the jungle. Um, this uh, that that's a good point. So jungle gives a lot of defensive benefits, and in this game, units project uh, a zone of control from a jungle into jungle. Um, I, I don't believe that, that the rules for jungle introduced in this game uh, pro prohibit that. Um, what experience finds, particularly given the dependence of these mechanized and motorized Chinese units is um uh is is the 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 need to use the roads right and so controlling these cross these crossroads become uh, uh decisive uh decisive uh pieces if i could add one of the other things is moving into the jungle is one thing moving out of it is another so it can be depending on where you put yourself if you're not able to get access to the road again um, even as the defender that has its own problems i don't think that's really an issue with anything that's there right now but as we advance further towards hanoi that starts to become part of the consideration all right so i'm going to go ahead and do a couple moves one thing i want to do uh, to satisfy kind of two simultaneous concerns is i'm going to move the 390th of the first core um in first moving point along primary roads to ha long uh, with Maritime, with the Marine, and then I want to move him the rest of the way up here, also on primary roads to Cam Fa, which makes him um, spoil um, uh, an airborne uh, into either of those areas, um, and get him a little bit closer to coming to the rescue of three one MR uh, if if the need be needs be. Um, and and I'm, while I nudge the rest of these guys a little bit closer to the front, just a little bit closer to the front, I'll I'll uh, open up the the line both in text and on uh, voice here in the channel for folks that uh, had questions on any of the previous. Is 
This is partly so I can stare at a train of X chart and calculate things while you just discuss amongst yourself. Going to move up this two core unit into the combat outpost. One, two, three. Try that. Eesh. So I leave that airfield wide open, huh? We'll try that. And now the last thing for me to figure out is if I'm nudging in, and I will, I, I will nudge in. Ugh. I don't like it, Sam, I am. So for 325, moving him to 3503 would allow him to have Zoc on 3603, which would gum up moves that try and, you know, swing wide. Um, but you could still leak through. However, if I come all the way down to 3504, I pretty much open the door over there. If you play with the supply rules, then... Is current position also nullifies supply unless the outpost falls? So that, that half of the map would be out of supply if they tried to move that way? Uh, correct, yeah. If, if he then takes combat units over land uh, to hop onto other roads, his supply uh, will not have the benefit of all the engineers that let him do that. Uh, and so it would then be harder to trace supply. That is a That is a great point. Okay, I'll just do a small move then here so that I can shift my sock a little bit closer but still hold the crossroads that I was going for. And uh, Relic, no worries. I was not hearing anything uh, on the stream or uh, getting recorded. So uh, if you got questions, though, feel free to chime up. All right, so... Um, Getting back into our setup here, um, and again, my regrets on uh, the YouTube recording will have these overlays I'm popping up. However, you guys aren't seeing it on the stream, I'm sorry to say. Um, but I do have, uh, those of you that are in Vassal with us, you can see on the strategic display um, uh, the current submarine ASW level um that we are in i imagine we're in the dry season person who chooses who chose when to do the assault prc you are correct the terrain is nightmarish enough without needing to add the, the, uh, the weather to it excellent so we'll have a sunny day in the dry season uh, uh and then i'll come here to what is the general game records track and we will um uh, go ahead and uh roll for our air points Per normal and so this is kind of one thing where this game goes to a very high level of abstraction and the standard game both the maritime and the air rules are highly 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 abstracted um, uh, but getting our initial uh, air points I'll go ahead and pull up um, this game is this module is pretty good about having most of the um, uh, play aids uh, in, uh, under this play aid charts button here um uh with the exception of the crt right that's one thing that publishers will do sometimes is that they will withhold the one secret sauce piece of cardboard in the box that way you know they do incentivize people actually buying the game uh but uh yeah so i'm just looking at the standard chart real quick for air points here we go standard game air points game turn one we each roll uh, and this is a thing where, uh, for those of you playing this system or other systems like this, the first time or two that you go through needing to do any of these checks or any of these rolls, you're spending a lot of time staring at the various DRMs or, or other results modifiers uh, until you realize that um, you know many of them become common unless an exception occurs. And so you get pretty quick at doing them. Uh, and so uh, we won't have any DRMs from airbase control. 
Uh, we don't have any carriers in a C hex or inshore boxes yet. For the moment, the carriers are still in the PRC holding box. Um, and so in this case, it's just going to be straight rolls for us um, under the uh, game turn one column with, of course, the non-allied player having a significant advantage. So let's go ahead and uh, gauge and each roll of those. Find my dice button up here. There it is. Roll the big three. Big three. Actually, that's a good number in this game. That is a good number for you. This is not so good for me. Okay, so my three garnered me two air points. Gage's eight garnered him four. So I'm just moving on the records track. Uh, those of you watching, you might see that on the text on the stream uh, in the game status track. So that is that's a two to one advantage, which is probably not nearly what he had hoped for. Um, but I'll take it. Uh, which gives him, uh, if I can zoom in uh, here, for those of you watching on YouTube, uh, for air superiority, that does get him into uh, advantage. So he will have an advantage on the air domain. All of this in this game and in the standard game are highly, highly abstract. That represents the effect of generation of combat air power, sustainment of combat air power, the employment of combat air power, how deep it is and how much you still have remaining, right? Um, and, and we can then generally assign the weight of that effort either to escort airdrops or to um, blow stuff up in, in close air support. Um, the standard game does not really allow for, say, supply interdiction or, or uh, um, seed or, or those other things, which when you get to the advanced game are, are actually baked into it. All right. Okay, so I think... Gage, unless you've got anything that you're thinking that we've got to do before we uh, roll into the first turn, I think we're ready to do that. Yeah, I think we're good. Um, the only thing we might want to spend time on, since we've alluded to it a little bit, for folks that are familiar, it may be worth going over anatomy of a counter, or why are we obsessed over these numbers? Yeah, no, very good question. And, and, and great to do. I'll zoom in here on my one core to a two brigade um, as, as an example. Um, and so um, this game, like, like I've said a couple of times, is pretty true to form on a lot of hex and counter operational scale land games where a lot of these things that are part of it uh, will, will be useful. On the top left here, we have a um, organizational identifier right, which is, uh, in this case, uh, 202 Brigade of the 1st Corps. Um, and so the other yellow units here, here's the 312th Division of the 1st Corps, right? Uh, we'll, we'll share that. Uh, as a mnemonic in this game, the color of the unit uh, are consistent. So all the yellow units for me are 1st Corps units, all the blue units are 2nd Corps units. Um, many games will use the um, NATO symbology, the current standard NATO symbology, to, to uh, differentiate an infantry unit versus a um, uh, mechanized unit versus a motorized unit versus artillery or, or um, um, marine, etc. Right. So you'll you'll have a lot of that uh, that you'll see there. So that way, at, at a glance, you can see that this is a motorized or mechanized or infantry. Um, on top of the NATO symbol uh, are then the uh, uh, indicators on its size, where uh, three X's would denote a core. Uh, you typically won't see that here on uh, uh, in the Next Wars series, but if you're looking at Eastern Front games, you will see those. Um, uh, two X's is a division. Uh, one X is uh, you know a, a brigade, and then you start breaking down. Uh, from there down into much smaller echelons, um, uh, battalions and companies. Um, and, and if you go down into tactical level games that do these, you can get to platoons. You, I have seen counters uh, in some of the tactical level games where it's an infantry symbol with a Roman numeral I. <laughs> and uh, you, you then start to think that that gets to be a little, a little bit abstract. Um, next word gets down to uh, companies. Yes. Um, uh, it, yeah. Yep, that, exactly, Gamator. That's about as low as you'll see here as a company. And and for the design philosophy in this game, it really does come down to what is the smallest independent combat element at this scale, right? That that would move something. And and 
you, if you look at some of, say, MMP's grand strategic series or grand tactical series, you will just see, you know, gobs and gobs and gobs of counters at, at smaller scales. But to a, a certain extent, that just becomes counter core. Um, uh, and so here, you know, there are lots of companies involved in all of these divisions. Um, uh, the only companies that you may see in, in this game are ones are, that are, are truly capable and unique, uh, given the order of battle of that belligerent. Um, the number in a circle on the left is the number of stacking points, uh, how eff effectively how big, heavy, or how much frontage that unit needs. And so four stacking points is the maximum before you start incurring stacking penalties. Number on the right, five in this case, is the efficiency of the unit or how capable it is. A higher efficiency unit is generally a higher caliber unit. And so uh, you would expect a six to do a lot better than a four. And then finally at the bottom, and, then, and so that comes down to training and efficiency and leadership doctrine as well. Uh, and then finally at the bottom, you, you get to the, the very famous, you know, hyphenated numbers that we get. And various games will use these for different purposes. This game is pretty standard where the first number is the combat power. Uh, and in this case, specifically the offensive combat power. The second number is the defensive combat power. And the third number is the movement factors or, or how mobile the unit is. And so not surprisingly here, um, Infantry have a pretty standard amount of uh, which is which is four and then you've got your motorized which is uh, a little bit more than that maybe a five or maybe a seven for some of the uh, motorized ones in the 83rd GA and then you finally your mechanized or armor um, might be even more than that you know six or eight. Uh, and, and that gets down to the basic anatomy of this counter. In the advanced game, uh, you are then going to be incentivized by the rules to have um, core um, unity, right? That you keep things whole or organic, or that you, you don't intersperse units of different formations on your line, um, which, which has some very valid um, reasons for that. As far as rules enforcement, it, it adds a bit. Uh, and here in the standard game, you, you won't find that. Um, but but um, if one wants to essentially role play this, um, you know, you'll, you'll want to keep your cores coherent. And, and uh, as I get to that, I'll, I'll take a brief pause before we get in here to, to mention role play in playing a new game that you don't understand fully, um, which is, Again, the systems are numerous. They're interlocking. They're complex, right? Uh, if if you have a traditional Euro analysis paralysis or AP player, you will grind to a halt, right? Trying to math it all out here, and, and that can be really frustrating. Um, so, my personal definition of a war game, particularly uh, a historic war game, is that um, for a, a historic based war game. Um, historic um, inputs should result in historic outputs. I'm not going to say they will, right? But I'm going to say that it's within the bell curve somewhere, right? It's within the realm of possibility that that if you did nothing else other than what both belligerents did in the actual combat, that amongst the possible combat outcomes um, that one would expect would be the one that happened. Um, and so with that being said, if that's, that's what, and, and I think a lot of designers would agree with that. So if that's what one is uh, trying to assert here, then feel free to sit back uh, into the operational chair and worry less about the systems. And if you're thinking about what you want to do, um, go with that role play, if you will, of I am the army commander. And, you know, I don't know how the math on this is necessarily going to work, but I do not like 3-1-MR being out there by himself. I just don't like it. I don't I don't need to necessarily add it up, and I don't need to, you know, understand if it matters if he's attacking from the jungle or from the plains. Um, I, uh, it's, it's not going to be good. I feel uncomfortable. Um, and, and I do that just from, you know, the, looking at it operationally. So some of you uh, may work on, um, you know, Army, UCOM um, planning staff. Uh, in the you know G5 or G3 or whatever, uh, and and you would have a pretty good intuition on some of the stuff. Those of us that are coming to this from more the armchair recreationalist or or the hobbyist, um, maybe you know this is how you are building that experience or intuition. But a lot of people that are coming to this are not unread or unwatched in uh, some of the military history. So feel free to use what you know, right? Lean on that. Um, yeah. All right. Any anything else? Yes. Yeah. 
the only thing I would add real quick, I think your, I think your last point was, was crucial. Um, something else to remember that may help you with role play is that each one of these represents quite a bit of living people um, of, your, of the country you're commanding, that realistically neither myself nor Alec have attachments to these countries, but the, the commanders leading them would. So it's easy to remember or easy to think, you know, oh, I'll, I'll sacrifice 3-1 MR. It's a 3-4-4, who cares? But it may help you to remember that it's also, you know, three or four digits worth of uh, living human beings that you might want to, you know, go home to their families and not have to write that they're all dead. So just a just a little something. All right. And with that, let's head over to, um, and, and again, my apologies uh, on the Discord stream uh, that you're not able to see this, but inside, for those of you on the Vassal server with us, the mock-up strategic display is a section of the phase track, which, which we'll click through this. And so whether um, it's prescribed by the offensive player here, the PRC, uh, initiative uh, and scenario uh, in the first turn and second turn is given to them. We'll skip the salmon colored uh, spaces here uh, as those are advanced game. We've determined air uh, and um, let's go ahead unless the, the game rules don't specify naval control on turn one, do they? Yeah, that's um, we know what the submarine threat is, but I think we actually get to roll to determine uh, control of uh, uh, Gulf of Tonkin, is that correct? I believe so. Okay, so this again gets us back to a, a, a very abstract uh, thing, particularly in a standard game here, which is, you know, uh, so first of all, let's think about, you know, the scale, scale of all of this, right? Uh, particularly in the scale of modern naval combat. Um, the scale of these um, hexes is, you know, something on, on the, the scale of single digit miles, right? Like it's, it's not that big. The time scale of a turn is three and a half days. It's half a week in this game, uh, which is a very long time in, in modern combat. A lot happens in three and a half days. Um, the, many of you know me as an air war gamer, right? And and for modern air operations, you will have completely executed a full air tasking order in ATO. You would be executing uh, the one behind it, and the third one would be in planning, right? Like you're you're three iterations into actually doing air war in three and a half days. So it's fairly abstracted here at at the three and a half day mark. Um, but uh, so, and, and with the ranges of, of uh, air, um, uh, uh, anti-ship cruise missiles, uh, with um, uh, anti-surface missiles uh, and uh, uh, guided artillery from these naval systems, it's all fairly generic. It's, it's kind of like what we just had on the air here of, well, China's got the advantage. We're going to be looking at the same thing here in the Gulf. Um, to figure out who has the advantage in the, the Gulf of Tonkin. Um, uh, just looked up game rule 2.7, by the way, seven and a half miles per hex. That is the width of a hex. So, um, so uh, popping over to our um, uh, standard play aids and looking at the maritime, which is eluding me for the moment, play aid. Air drop, clearing, placement, sea control. Here we go. Um, so for the sea control play aid, uh, we see here that uh, for the Gulf of Tonkin, just straight up game rule, specific rule for us here, uh, minus two, right? This is in the backyard of many of the, the, the Chinese ports. And for those of you that can see the strategic display on, on the YouTube channel, I mean, it's, it's here bracketed by, you know, the, the coast of mainland China, Hainan Island, significant uh, naval presence here by China within the Gulf of Tonkin just in peacetime, right? So, so uh, it, it's, it's home turf uh, there. So there will be minus two on this roll just due to proximity. Um, I'm going to just skim over these DRMs. I don't believe that we're going to have any that apply. We will have um, the difference between the sub and ASW level that will apply to reflect how effective uh, the Chinese submarines could be. 
uh, nope, not that one, uh, which is, uh, it's only plus or minus one. The subs, yeah, um, not a lot of anti-submarine capability on behalf of the Vietnamese and a fairly robust sub presence on the Chinese. So one further benefit for the submarine advantage, so now we're at minus three. Um, this area down here does not apply. PRC cruise missiles and apply in short box. Um, yeah, we're not doing that. Okay, so I'll let Gage make this roll at minus three to figure out if he outright controls the Gulf of Tonkin right now or if I'm able to contest it with my shore-based naval fires and my limited navy. All right, rolling. So I got a seven, which minus three is four. Okay, so that's contested now, which which is um, will have an effect on his subsequent movement roles of uh, his amphibs and surface action groups into um, into the Gulf. And again, it's it's a huge abstraction here, right? Like no one's necessarily saying that you know that guided missile cruiser is going to be fifteen miles off the shore, right? Or in that specific spot over those three and a half days, right? But but that it is able to be in that vicinity providing effects in that region. That's really what it's getting at. Um, and and he, uh, essentially, um, given this result, he may choose, or, or the dice may produce results without effectively the Chinese naval commanders don't feel that they have an acceptable risk threshold to employ the naval forces in a way that are would be most advantageous for the ground campaign. All right, so that got us through air and naval. All right, and now time for the main show. Initiative, move, and combat, move. Um, okay. Real quick before you start going, I, I'll bring up for everyone, uh, at least on YouTube, but for those of you that have it, a sequence of play. When in doubt, live off of this. Hop back to rules as you need them. This is home base for you, is the sequence of play. Okay, proceed. Okay, so if you recall, I have my shaping units, my airborne and my maritime, as sort of my ability to move the map around if I don't like it. Um, as Alec mentioned, the contested sea control is a big deal. Combined with the fact that they would have to go into a contested landing, I really don't want to risk those guys at this point. So they're right out. So then I start to look at the situation and where could I commit my airborne. Uh, truth be told, I'd like to see things develop a little bit. I only have four air mobile points this turn, and he's got two air points that he could use to try to intercept. So before he spends those, I would have to spend units to escort in order to impact that. The other thing is the aerial advantage, as opposed to superiority or, or supremacy, is not nearly as helpful for me for landing airborne troops. So as I look for risk versus reward, with the board like it is right now, I don't think it's a good idea to employ those units. So that takes me to my two primary group armies. The easy move I can make is, well, maybe not easy, but at least straightforward. It's going to be banging my head against a proverbial wall. Um, is going to be taking the 92nd and 145th south to 3904. That immediately stops their movement because, one, it's jungle. That's incredibly beefy movement. And, two, they're moving into a Zoc of two different units. Uh the mechanized unit does not project a Zoc. The, oh, the armored unit? Yeah, because it only has one stacking point. You need two stacking point to, pro to project a Zoc. Right you are. And that's a good point. So, thank you. So this does still go into the Zoc from the Dongdang Combat Outpost, but considering that is the... That's what I have to crack, or at least what I have to start attempting to crack, that's not a bad idea for me. So then, going over to the other side, the forces that I previously had arrayed before we corrected the rules around 4603, I'm going to move back in. So I'll cross the border and threaten this unit, and then I'll also move up their associated rocket regiment. Now, as I look at the other units here, I do have some options. I could spread these guys out, but it's not enough to get a combat bonus. You have to get to at least three hexes to start getting DRMs in that. I'm really not eager to try to attack this unit in 4205, but you know we're playing open hand here. If this was a closed game, I would leave these guys there, 
just to force that unit from being able to move. That 895 is a very powerful trio. And if I could sit him there at 4205 for the rest of the game, I consider that a win. None of the other units up at the border are that tough, though another couple of them are pretty good. I think the only other move I'm going to make is move the 83rd Group Army's Rocket Regiment down one. And this isn't really necessary. Their range superscript is four. But it uh, it's going to make me feel better. So, as I look at how the situation has developed, I have a couple different combat options, which is what we're preparing to go to to play. Uh, before we do, though, I will pause for any questions. Yeah, just real quick. No, don't feel bad at all. This is a thick skin area. Um, the nature of this game is so many rules. It is inevitable. Like like Alex said at the beginning, you're going to butcher some. I butcher some. This is not my first time playing, and I still forget the two point sock rule. So, absolutely helpful. And whoever you're learning this game with, if both of you guys can take that attitude towards, hey, don't worry about it. Call it when you see it. Move on when you don't. And it gets to two things. And the first, the first is, you know, at least an interesting discussion and reflection upon, you know, why that's a rule and what that is. Like, oh, right. If one dives back into the Zoc rules, it explicitly states that, uh, you know, two stacking points need to be present in the hex for there to be a Zoc. And one could think that, you know, one, you know, could have power, but, you know, there's a threshold. You need a certain amount of power to be able to disrupt that. Okay. Got it, you know. Um, and then one can then take the next segment and one could then be critical of, of the design, right? And, and we can all, you know, uh, be critics. And, and from a game-ism standpoint, right, it's, it's uh, a thing where it's one more thing to mess up. <laughs> right it's 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 another thing to get wrong and it may or may not add value and and, and so that's 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 a critique right um right. but in it, it, it is as it is and of course you know folks are of course welcome to home rule things as you play through things and you feel things are broken do understand that that these games in this system now particularly has had um a play test community and experience that has uh at this point spanned five or more years Right. And and so um, the system works fairly well. But you paid for the game. What What's Mitch Lane going to do? Jump through your computer and punch you? Right. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> particularly if you're doing solitaire. Yeah. And the the issues are partly because of there's these battalion units and in some case, smaller units that, you know, can't realistically project a Zoc. And where the line is for what is or isn't a Zoc, that's. That's very hard to call anyway. Fantastic it point. Also, it, it also relates to the scale. It's the question of if this was broken out into smaller scales, some of these small units would still get a sock because they could definitely within the 12 kilometer hex, seven and a half miles, they definitely could project something there. It's just not enough to reach into the next hex. Well, if uh, that mostly brings that discussion to a close we'll go to the next phase here which is which is combat now um combat in these games uh you know there's lots of ways there's lots of conventions and there's no wrong way to do it uh, this this game it does what I, I feel is likely most common and of course um Gamator, feel free to correct me if i if my if i recall wrong on this but but most games require that don't require the attacker to pre-declare everything that they're going to do. There are going to be restrictions on a given hex may only be attacked once, and a given attacker may only attack once, and things like that. But but the um, uh, um, depending on the system, it may allow for um, gauge here to declare an attack, resolve it have it play out, and then do in advance if he's entitled to one, and then look at the board state and figure out what the next thing is. We've got three and a half days here, right? You know, so so one can allow for, um, you know, um, uh, some sub-turn resolution on how these things go. My recollection is is that in, in the combat phase, and of course that's probably easy enough here to look just at the play aid, to see that it declares and resolves all combats one at a time. Yeah. It gets a bit different if you're playing play by mail, where you tend to do to declare all of your all of your combats. You have to no choice but to sort of declare your combat, and you cannot resolve them without the help of the other player. So, oftentimes in play by mail, you would have a thing where you declare all the combat, you leave room for the other player to resolve their half of it, and and have uh, 
conditions for them to keep going or to abort and kind of reach back to you. But this is live, so you get to cooperate. Yeah, boy, Gamata, you bring up a really great point here, which is, you know, play by mail has been part of wargaming forever, right? <laughs> Even before digital implementations. Um, and, and the digital implementations only helped that and allowed that right, and expedited that. You know, if I if I hit my drop down, which you won't see on the stream here, but, you know, there is a, you know, um, uh, begin log file button here, which will allow me to log my moves and allow my opponent to replay them. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know if you and I have played this uh, PBEM uh, uh, or any of the next four games before, uh, but but um, you do have to uh, have some allowances when doing play by mail in games such as this to have, you know, gentlemen's agreements, if you will, on on, you know, communicating intent to each other. Um, you know, trying to suspend disbelief and allow for you to commit um, based on the things that you know when you know them uh, and to trust the other player to resolve things in a way that keeps the game moving, <laughs> right? Because the, the whole thing would lock up uh, if we had right. a whole front here with, and in the advanced game and the whole thing here, if we would had 15 hexes where things were happening, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it would, it would be unplayable. So, so um, maybe I'll uh, invite you, Gamator, to give any thoughts here uh, while we're at it on on how this game works as a play by email type game for folks that you know just have a really hard time setting aside two or three hours every you know Thursday with their you know online opponent. Like, you know, if someone wants to get into doing a, an operational game like this, play by email. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's a system that works reasonably well. Um, you have to be very careful about. Your combat. The combat is always the state that uh, that uh, is slow, um, and, and it requires more back and forth. So you tend to have to prepare your combats. There's helpful uh, lettered um, counters that you can drop at the different combats, so you can you can label them A, B, C, D, and so on, and then uh, kind of order them for resolution, uh, which really helps uh, to, to to fix things in the as I said, you, you give your opponent kind of your what condition would you stop? Like for example, if you're having a six to one attack against an X, you fully expect the attack to succeed. But you know, the CRT and the dice and things you didn't expect come into play and then you lose that attack or you fail to advance. And that maybe that stops the rest of your turn and you have to go back and forth. Uh and you, you have to expect that a, a full initiative turn of, of this is probably like eight or nine round trip of email at least, if not 10, 12, um, or of uh, Dropbox these days mostly. Yeah, Dropbox and Google Drive are you know great tools to help with those logs. I'll even say Discord is, is actually a, a platform that's pretty good uh, for facilitating communication yeah. and, and log exchange as well. It's not quite as, as tightly integrated uh, as the things that are integrated into your OS like Dropbox. Um, you but... also go a bit hybrid where you do the movement fully play by mail because the system works really well for that. And then you resolve combat live. I've done that with uh, for Korea with, an, with a, a, another player that had a lot of analysis paralysis. So instead of spending an hour and a half waiting for them to like calculate all their turns, uh, we just uh, we did the move on our own and then we would get back together only for combat resolution, which took only maybe 20 minutes. Hmm. That's an interesting technique. Uh, I'll also uh, throw a technique out there for folks that are looking at play by mail, um, uh, which is being, you know, so you log, be verbose in your chatting, right? Like theoretically, you know, the, the chat feature here in uh, within Vassal, uh, you know, allows, you know, for uh, live play with an opponent that you're not using, you know, uh, I guess back in the day when this was starting Ventrilo, right? Or TeamSpeak to, to speak with, or now Discord. Um, but uh, for play by email, it's crucial, right? Because uh, as I'm going through play by email, um, I'll, I'll do just what Gamator said, which is, you know, when I'm declaring an attack, I'm like, all right, I'm assuming this is going to succeed. And, and when it does, uh, advance after combat into long song. And if for some reason that goes off the rails, let me know, right? And then you put in spacers occasionally if you want to allow for the opponent to record and do some things. And then you hop back into what you're doing. Um, if if you feel that the log could is likely to continue or could continue, 
for those of you, and uh, we'll share a link here. I know a lot of people in the Hex Encounter community are aware of it, but there is a fantastic Discord server for um, Vassal play-by-mail, um, uh, which uh, not uh, terribly surprisingly is called, um, uh, it's called just that, Vassal PBEM is, is the name of the server. And so if you need a link to that, uh, just let us know in the chat and we'll, we'll share that so everyone can, uh, can know. All right, great points, Commander, thank you. Um, uh, any, any other uh, uh, pre-combat resolution questions here from the peanut gallery? All right, uh, I think uh, I see Onion Man's typing. <laughs> All right, uh, Gage, do we have you back yet? Yes. Okay. I labeled all of the potential combat... Oop, I missed one, of course. The potential combat eligible hexes. Of course, you're not attacking E here, for sure. Uh, but um, uh, which of these are you interested in resolving? So um, my main effort is going to be A, but I also think that's going to be the single most complex combat. And from a game standpoint, it's one that I want to make sure I have air points available for. So I want to see where you spend your air points. I think our best bet is actually to start with the simplest combat, which is going to be combat D. Um, uh, D is in Delta? D is in Delta. Okay. Can I zoom in? Nope, that's where I zoom in. Okay, so we're here on Combat D. Um, for those of you that have downloaded, um, first of all, if, if you've not been to Mitch Land's OneDrive site uh, for this, he has posted a ton of PDFs of game materials, examples, and also resource materials, references, the bibliography, if you will, on a lot of these games. Of course, you won't find the CRT, right? That's, that's part of the, the secret sauce that they hold back. Um, but uh, here in the... Uh, module you'll find the uh um, subsequence of play for resolving combat and uh of course you'll have that on the actual play aids and pds that you can get going um all right um and and as commander points out the crt is common for the series and noting that as they do little bit of incremental additions like for instance in this game the addition of jungle as a terrain type which and then ends up having its own um entry on the crt uh, does it so there's there's small modifications but effectively yes if you have the CRT for one you have a CRT for them all and you know I uh, would uh, not at all be concerned about Mitch and, and Gene hunting you down if if you sent a you know cell phone photo of the CRT to your opponent right to, so that you guys could facilitate playing if one of you owned the game but the other one didn't um, but uh, um, uh, that is not the official GMT line uh, so getting at this, um, we're, we're in the first subset here, which is uh, declare attacks, which we've done. Uh, so now we're going to compute the initial odds. So to do this initial odds computation, we'll, we'll note that I have four defending factors and he is attacking with nine combat factors. Um, the Vassal module here is pretty good at marking overlays for who's doing what. And you'll notice that control K uh, denotes that the unit is attacking, so uh, you can know who's been activated. Um, for those of you that are doing this with the real game, um, my life pro tip for you is go on Amazon.com or wherever you prefer to go for your online shopping and get tile spacers for um, laying floor tile. Uh, those little tiny plastic X's that are used to offset those fit perfectly on a hex stack and are just nice little additions that you can drop on your stacks to know things that you've done something with and things that you haven't. So um, I'll have to get an affiliate link and you know share a link to something like that. But um, yeah, those little those little uh, uh, tile spacer uh, X's are perfect uh, for doing this in real life. Um, uh, so so we, we've seen that initial odds, but of course the true initial odds are, are, are going to be adjusted based on the terrain. 
um, where, where we note that it is rough terrain here. This is attacking into rough. Um, that is jungle. So this is rough jungle. So looking at jungle, we see that attacks by armor and mechanized are at one half. And, and Ongi Man brought up the point here on occasionally getting confused or needing clarification on, you know, what do they mean by um, armor? What do they mean by mechanized? What do they mean by motorized? Um, any unit that you'll, you'll find that is um, got a red movement factor is mechanized. Any unit that you find that has an, uh, an orange movement factor is motorized. Um, now, it, interestingly, you occasionally get to where the NATO symbology will will have um, an armor or or a um, you know an armor infantry unit that might in one type of unit be mechanized as a motorized. But but I go by the color. Of the moving factor for mechanized versus motorized armor um, in the NATO symbology is all going to be the oval in that NATO um, hex. So in this case, he kind of um, you know certainly the 1674 GA suffers that penalty, and and it's I guess kind of open for discussion here if we feel that the 163 GA as a motorized um, unit would also suffer that penalty. So I could say this benefits me if I claim it doesn't, but I would tell you just from what I know about these kinds of operations, it really should. If you're having trouble moving tracks through the through the jungle, you're definitely going to struggle with wheels. Like yeah. The yeah. only places I can think of where that would be an exception is if I was to stick strictly to the primary road, and that would be a nightmare because you would be able to have one company of riflemen hold me off for hours. Right. And so this is a perfect example here, everybody, on what I was just mentioning on, first of all, not being too bent around the axle on it. Like, you know, I, I would have been fine if he said he was going with one factor or, or one and a half factors. Right. <laughs> like it's it's fine. Um, but but in this case, um, you know, uh, go with what feels right and, and just roll with it. So, yeah, so we'll take both of those. So that's four and a half factors um, of of combat. And here um, the. Uh, Infantry unit is a leg unit, which gets actually a double defensive bonus in jungle. So he it's nine to four based on what you see on the chits. Um, modified for my jungle terrain, I have eight defense factors versus his four and a half attack factors. It's actually one to two. <laughs> yeah, this is not great. With there's a remainder, you get a remainder, but that that's a one to two uh, basic. Uh, um right. initial odds so that's awesome now the good news is that this is he he has surprise here so now we're at the part here where we're doing our, our column shifts uh and so so looking on the crt there's um a whole um brown bottom left corner of the crt uh, and, and so actually establishing our initial placement here um the uh jungle grabs which call which row up there on it it's um there we go it's highlands jungle and highland woods so it's that middle row and at one to two that's column four which is super um column shifts in his favor um his lead unit is far more effective a combat unit than mine in terms of leadership doctrine organization etc right and so he's actually going to get two column bonuses adjustment for his leadership uh, so which brings him from the four column to the six column. He's not attacking into a city or a fortification. So that that will not change. This is surprise. Uh, if you have the SSR up. Is that a one or a two column shift for surprise? I have to get back to it. Sorry. Give me a second. I will give you zero if you don't declare what you're... <laughs> it's one column shift to the right. One. Okay. So I can see to the seven column now. Um... This is not exploitation. This is not amphibious. And there is, are you getting artillery support on this from the 74? Yes, I'm going to go ahead and commit them. Okay, which would uh, bring him to eight. Now, this is an interesting thing, and I'll have to dig into the rules on this. Typically, the um, artillery companies that you see there, the, the 74th artillery, are reserved for the advanced game um, with them as explicit uh, combat units. Eric, thanks for coming by. Um, 
uh, guess the rest of the recording. So usually those are exp uh, in the advanced game to roll that in as an explicit effect. Um, however, within these basic standard game scenarios, that, that is, those are now explicitly enumerated as things that go in the mix. And so, um, you know, I, I don't think that it's that far of a push to say that you've got... Um, uh, you know, the player being able to control where they get their uh, army's additional artillery focus. So, um, so yeah. So, he started on the four column, <laughs> but, but between his um, army's artillery emphasis, the um, uh, surprise in the scenario, and the sheer capability of these soldiers and their or uh, training organization and leadership, He's worked himself all the way to the eight column, which on this same terrain would be equivalent to a three to one advantage. So, so he's worked himself into a pretty good spot. So yeah, now that we know what, add, a, go ahead. If I can add real quick, when you're playing the, the PRC in this game, that's something to keep in mind. You're almost always gonna have an efficiency advantage. And especially you only get the surprise advantage for the first game turn. So sometimes it makes sense to try attacks like this that don't look like they're going to be that good because by the time you actually do all the column shifts you get pretty favorable results all right and so now that we've done that uh, we now get to allocation starting with the attacker he may at allocate this division this army's um um uh attack helicopters to support this attack. He can allocate air points, uh, you know, the abstraction of his fixed wing aviation. Uh, he can allocate naval units to do shore bombardment, uh, supporting this attack if, if, if he chooses. Um, and so uh, that will be his first to allocate. So in this case, I am gonna allocate my group army helicopters, which in this case for the 74th is the one that's sitting over in the holding box. So I'll increment him. And yep, you see that he did the shortcut here, control P in the module to indicate that it has one activation. These get two activations per game turn. Um, and so he's used one. Okay, and so, so that will end up being a DRM in his advantage. Now, let me check real quick. I want to zoom out. I, I do have one combat aviation regiment here that I can check their range, and I think I'm out of luck. <laughs> they do not have the legs to ha support combat operations out there. Um, in fact, that's that's you know the end of where I can go. So um, he will cannot benefit from uh, my uh, assault aviation. Um, and I only have the two uh, air points, and I am much more concerned about um, the kind of the, really the key point there, Dong Deng and Lang Song. So I think I want to hold for the moment and not commit anything. Okay, so all of that having been determined, um, we now resolve air defense fire, and uh, we'll check the, the aid here. Um, it should be not too bad. Um, given how close that is to China and how ill-equipped that unit is. For air defense fire, um, I get, let's see here, um, he is nowhere near an aviation uh, airfield or, or installation of mine. He is nowhere near an armor or mechanized unit of mine. And and so, and he didn't have to overfly anything. So th this, this is going to happen without a DRM. And the um, target side has... Um, I'm sorry, and he has air uh, advantage, uh, which is this column here. So without rolling anything, I'm rolling on this column, which doesn't give me a lot of good um, uh, rolls, but you know, it could happen. So I rolled a nine, which is nothing good for me ever. Uh, and so uh, the organic air defense fire here, um, be it you know, long range, um, you know, strategic SAMs in the country, you know, these helicopters were flying too low and then the organic infrared uh, countermeasures and, and radar guided guns um, just just were not not there. So, so uh, those air points get through just fine. Um, and now that that's happened, we can come back here and figure out the rest of our DRMs. So reminding everyone, we're still in the eight column and um, looking down the blue area for DRMs, uh, there's one in his favor for his combat support, right? The one helicopter. There is um, nothing from hex frontage um, since it's you know kind of coming along one axis. 
nothing uh he doesn't have any mountain infantry coming at me so no benefit there um there was a remainder on the combat odds calculation this wasn't exactly one to two initially so he'll get uh one more in his favor so that's two for the remainder this is not light infantry this is infantry but light infantry would have a yellow movement factor so i don't get the light infantry bonus i'm not in an installation so no bonus from the infrastructure i am not in that i'm not mountain infantry so that won't matter this is not a multi-formation attack this is all the 74 ga so they are attacking as they've trained um yeah i got nothing so this is actually on the eight column with two drm in um gauge's favor G G gauge you concur yes i'm reading the same okay and so now we'll roll die allocate losses and retreat in advance so let's see what happens so in this case i rolled a seven which we modified to a five on the eight column, that is going to be one loss for me and two losses for Alec. Oof. Good point so, there, um, Gimmater, the the uh, um, that this is nonlinear. And if you look through it, there are some pretty obvious uh, spots where you know, yeah, you can yeah. get one thing in your benefit and end up in a worse spot. And it, again, fog and friction of war. You know, bad yeah. stuff happens. Yeah, generally, IR, multi IR DRMs will give you IR results, which will give you more success, but the cost part of the success, that's the part that you don't really predict. You might take a step loss when you might have been able to avoid it with a lower result, surprisingly. Now, what this is going to get us is, okay, so... so um... We now actually get to the concept of retreat in operational scale games, right? Since... since um... Um, I took two step losses. Most of these units only have two steps, right? In fact, in this game, so, some games will have three and four step units that have replacement counters. I'm looking at you, John Butterfield, right? Um, and so you can absorb a lot of step losses. Most games acknowledge that counters have a front and counters have a back. So most units are either one step units or two step units. And so I certainly don't want to um, have to endure a... Uh, a two-step loss because that's an elimination of the unit and and that's super bad for me uh and so um hopping real quick into the rules for retreat or right, that's probably in the back end of combat so i'm just gonna and again so these are where you go in and you just really quickly hop in and and skim over uh things to make sure that you're doing rules roughly in the right order here here we go so um, I was not forced to retreat, but sometimes games allow for a voluntary retreat to negate step losses. If, if an R result had happened in the CRT, there would be a mandatory retreat. But and, and in this case, actually, there is um, uh, voluntary ignoring of retreats, uh, potentially at the uh, cost of incurring additional step loss. It appears that in this game... Um, uh, retreat is not something that a defender may opt to do to ignore a step loss. Yep, that division's a goner. Yep, that division's a goner. Th th thanks. Thanks, Commander. Uh, so we'll go ahead and place that in the eliminated um, column, and he just got blown away. So theoretically, uh, prior to this, um, yeah, and, and you did, uh, you know, one of those would have been determined to have been the lead unit, and it must take the first step loss to satisfy uh, a combat result. And I'd like it, to talk a little bit about this. In this case, I actually picked the, the lead unit that I would not want to pick, just to show you guys that this does matter. I picked the one that starts with six attack power. With this one step loss decrement, it loses one step of efficiency, goes down to five from six, and it's fully half. So just like that, I'm one of my most uh, potent units has now been reduced to another one of my sort of mediocre units. Normally, you do want to pick something with high efficiency, but the trick is to pick something with high efficiency with a, an attack rating that you won't be sad if it goes away. And uh, another thing that comes into play is the reconstitution cost. So some units are cheaper to rebuild or rebuildable. Um, and so if you've got, for example, the option of doing it with an infantry unit, uh, you might want to do use your infantry in it because it's usually something you can rebuild. Whereas depending on the scenario and the the game in the series, you might not be able at all to rebuild a mechanized unit. That's a great point. 
Okay, and so now we'll get into a concept in the game, which is advance after combat, which is um, the, uh, particularly in armor warfare uh, and in mobile motorized warfare, you can cover a lot of distances and a lot of ground, particularly if your attack results in a route, right? And, and so if you're looking at case yellow as an example, right? Like you can get a spearhead and a thrust and you can just keep running. And this is partially reflected here in, in all games in advance after combat rules. So pretty typically here, um, if the defender's hex is vacated through retreat or loss, you may move anybody uh, into, and you must move someone, but you can generally move anybody up to stacking allowances into the vacated hex. Um, additionally, in the case of this game, um, in most games, um, motorized or mechanized units that had a um, multi-hex retreat of their op opponent or an elimination of their opponent may move into yet another adjacent hex. And in this case, if you're moving into difficult terrain, you must do so along a road, but that would allow him to move into 4503 or 45, 4604 with one or both units. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and move both units in. Again, if my ultimate goal is to keep moving towards Hanoi, that's one hex closer. All right. And that is the first combat, <laughs> right? Um, now that that is known and uh, he is where he wants to be. Oh, actually, are you doing a second hex uh, advance? Yeah, you could move forward one more along the road. Continue to move on. Yep, and that's that's you know just key. You know that is a good thing. And I, now I'm a little bit worried about the coast, right? Yeah, and see, this is for if you end up playing China, this is exactly what you want to see. You want to see Vietnam struggling to get back to these crossroads, such as in uh, 4506 or 4206, and it puts the the Vietnamese player in an uncomfortable position. For do they keep their defenses up? and halt the main attack, or do they go back to the crossroads to try to halt a flank in? For the PRC player, either of these are okay because both of them ultimately give you more freedom of maneuver, regardless of what he chooses. Well, so the more times I can put the opposing player in this predicament, the more likely it is I'm going to get to Hanoi. Well, and and we're, we're not going to you would not necessarily choose to do it due to concerns about your supply line. But um, I'll, I'll highlight on initiative turns here in the next war series uh, a very important consideration, which is we are now entering into, um, you know, hypothetically, we resolve all these combats, right? And, and for the sake of the remaining time we have on the stream, we won't. You know, the rest of them would happen in very similar ways with allocation of air points and air defense fire and, you know, nudging, move, walking around the CRT like we've done. We then go into the elite reaction phase. And uh, for me... And that is a very, very limited move for the defender. That is only my most capable units at this point in the turn are able to move. They have to be um, a, a six, seven, or eight efficiency unit. And I don't know if you've noticed um, the SRV units here. I'm all fives and fours. You know, I got a six over here, but he's in a Zoc, right? He, he's going to be locked in. I, it's, I'm looking at people in my backfield. Maybe I could, you know, the 308 I could move. Maybe, um, you know, Hanoi. But, of course, I want to keep that guy in Hanoi. I go all the way down here and look at some of these guys. But, no, all these guys are too inefficient. So, so hypothetically here, you know, I can see now a hole in my line. I've got a whole line here that is not in any Zoc that can start running down uh, up the middle, right? And so what I might do then on my elite reaction movement is try and block that some way. And so I might do, um, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I would do, <laughs> six. <laughs> because otherwise what he's gonna to get to do here in the remaining part of his turn looking at oops uh, yeah looking looking at the sequence of plays he then gets into an exploit movement and an exploit movement he gets to um push ahead with his units that aren't otherwise locked down he can exploit an opening and it's only my most capable disciplined unit that could have reacted to try and stop that which i would have done thoughts on that uh gauge or commander yeah, absolutely. I think it would 
that would definitely remove some of this, you know, what do I get out of it? He chooses to move something from the backfield, so he doesn't sacrifice the combat efficiency at the border, <laughs> and he removes my ability to just run rampant behind his lines. But... Uh, other, but now this unit is committed there, so in the event that one of my other attacks were to break through, I'd be able to push. In addition, I talked earlier in the turn about not wanting to commit airborne because I was worried about them getting overwhelmed. Now, 3709 and 3809 both look like very tempting places to drop airborne brigades. There's nothing that can get to them that's even close, and it would put them close enough to go up and help their buddies at the border if they had to. You can also use them to take that airbase in 3810. Yep. Which would, yep, get... which would shape air points going ahead. And allow you, with sufficient air superiority, to use uh, air transport to move units in there and an airbase that close to hanoi in chinese hands would be very good for the prc player yeah there's an optional rule that also available to uh, if supply rules are in play to bring in uh supply of that airbase for your airborne units which can really be really annoying in the backfield um and so getting into the discussion of the supply rule let's assume that that unit either i decided not to or was insufficient on the exploit movement, um, the Chinese player could push this stack, um, you know, all the way through this hole, right, and start working their way in, right? There are no Zox. There's nothing keeping them from doing so. The reason to not do so um, <laughs> uh, is because you are playing with the supply rules, as you should always be. And me taking this Hexpex, 4506, locks that guy out from getting you know beans bullets and gas right uh and and that unit then quickly becomes combat ineffective and so he would have to if he i mean he could do that boy would that wreck my day right um but he would have to significantly tangle and and threaten um units up here so that he can ensure that he maintains supply and i did not have the freedom to respond to cut supply are, are secondary rule allowed for supply under the supply rule? It's one of those fake things where it just says road in the, yeah. in the series rule. Yeah. I would say from, from what I know, I would be comfortable playing that. When you think about what you could use to get along supplies and what you would need to supply a division's worth of troops, it would take a long time, but over three and a half days, I think it's doable so long as that's not the only thing going to every unit, you know? Right, and the game rules in 13.1.3 are road. As long as you can trace, you know, for a line of communication as a continuous line of road hexes and the trail, again, we call it trails, the uh, words mean things. The secondary road is still a road. So this is the system, and you know, for me, you know, I, I I enjoy the hypotheticals, and I enjoy looking at the concept of modern technologies and modern organizations and doctrine in conflict. You know, we've got lots of great historical examples, and we got lots of great games about World War Two and you know the early World War One and earlier conflicts. Um, you know, uh, it it you know takes something kind of interesting and special to really start to tease out how things might work. This system is is very, very much biased to do land warfare, land combat, right? And that's my criticism of the system is, you know, the market wants to buy games where you do this. You shove chits at each other and play bumper tanks, right? Um, you know, uh, various g games in the system have to have um, specific allowances uh, for air and naval that allow for the land fight to happen, right? Whereas someone like me who really does focus on gaming in the air domain, or I have friends that focus on gaming in the maritime domain, may you know very much point to contemporary readings and games and, and theory that that will will you know point out that there's another line of thought, which is the air interdiction would keep all of this from happening, or the naval interdiction would keep all of this from happening, or whatever that is. So so my criticism of the game system is is it focuses on on uh, the, the land combat. But that being said, if one then gives it that 
um, allowance. Like, okay, we're doing land combat here, fine. Um, I, I think it's a very fun system that, that allows to get into that. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree overall. I think uh, I, I probably spend more time in land domain gaming than Alec in general, and I I enjoy the heck out of it, but he's he's right. You have to start with the initial conceit of most of these are not necessarily places where land combat is truly likely, so much as interesting places it could occur. Um, you know, the, the Chinese threatened, quote-unquote, reunification of a rebellious province in Taiwan has been beaten on since the nationalists retreated there in the 40s. Like, so it's a place that it could happen. Is it likely to happen? Is that really going to be a big ground fight? Mm, maybe. But once it's there, it makes sense. Vietnam is similar. The um, the the Sino-Vietnamese conflict in the 70s, uh, one of the lessons of that was the same thing that we've shown here. The terrain in northern Vietnam is awful. Um, it set things a certain way, and... The PRC presumably knows that in real life. But once you get past that conceit, I would agree. What I really like about this game is that it shows some of the concepts of modern combat very well. Even if it's in ways that are a little clumsy or a little abstracted, I think simply having it modeled is worthwhile. Uh, the optional supply rule comes to mind. I know there's plenty of uh, similar supply rules in World War II and earlier era games. I, I played some of them. I enjoyed some of them. But it's nice to have it here because it's a reminder that no matter how good that awesome rocket artillery regiment you have or all those BMPs or BTRs or whatever other system you like, they have to get fuel from somewhere. They have to get guns from somewhere if they run out. They have to get weapons or ammo, munitions, etc. So they have to have some way to trace back. I think the other thing I like about this, and at the end of a two-hour stream, you guys may think I'm, I'm hot, is... Not what I'm going to call the simplicity, but what I will call the straightforwardness of this. Every rule, you you look at it, you implement it, you move on. You look at it, you implement it, you move on. And as Alec alluded to earlier, the longer you play this game, it becomes apparent that some of these rules are really more just a check by exception. Like they're going to fall one way or the other most of the time. There's something to be said for that. Many operational war games are not this... I guess, straightforward. Uh, again, I don't want to say simple. This is not a simple game by any metric. But they're they're not as, as procedurally driven. Move down the line. Make sure you have everything. Uh, some of the ones I've played have almost as many exceptions to rules as they do rules, where certain units can do certain things that other units can't do those things, but these units can. And it, it, it's an effort to put more fidelity into the game for how different types of units work, but it goes out of control very quickly. So there's an interesting sidebar happening here in the chat, which which I'll uh, chime in on, which is discussion of the air rules when one does get into the full game. And I'll, I'll fully acknowledge my bias here as an air war gamer, right? That's what I am, is I'm an air war gamer. And, and I, I adore this system's advanced air rules in the original form, in, in Next War Korea, right? Um, because what it really does get to you to is to understanding force packaging, Right, that that you would be bringing uh, a carrier air wing that has um, strike assets, uh, air superiority assets, and electronic attack assets, and that they are used in tandem and in certain ways. And same thing with some of the larger um, high value aircraft that the Air Force may bring, or some of the um, tactical air units and close air support air, air units. And there's a lot of mix to it. I personally like playing the air only variant of Next War Korea, right? Where you're just playing the air war and doing that force packaging against each other. Because there's very few games that we have out there that really look at the concept of, of air combat in the modern sense, uh, following a kind of modern thinking and doctrine. And, and I, I find it to be just fascinating. Um, it's a lot of rules weight in this game. And if, if your thing is bumper tanks, it's a distraction. If your thing is, you know, looking at the complete picture or, or the air warfare, then um, then it's it's uh, it's it's your back and, and it's mine. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll the, go ahead. The advanced air rules in the game have been obviously. I think they they were used previously, or at least they've been worn a lot, and they play surprisingly fast for the weight of them. Um, I find that that. It's only about a third or a quarter of a turn that is spent doing the uh, the air war usually, um, and then obviously that's only the first couple of turns because in most games by by turn three one side is total supremacy. 
which I think, you know, maybe it fits with a lot of current thoughts on how, you know, and actually, if you read the opening sections of the rule books, you know, the, th the premise here is that it's going to be fast, that it's going to be a lot of attrition, and that it's things are going to be decisive pretty quickly, and, and particularly in the air and in the air domain, right? You're going to by, you know, ten days into the conflict by ten three, it will you know not be unclear <laughs> who who uh, has brought more guns to the fight, right? And who's who's going to be better at it? Um, this gives me a brief segue, which I'll discuss, which is um, the discussion on approaches to rules weight and. Um, additional rules to do higher fidelity looks at systems. And there's kind of two philosophies here on this. This game takes a very traditional look on all of it, which is simply add rules, add sections, add, adv add an advanced game, add a lot of options. And they're, they're all a lot of fun. That's, it's a perfectly fine way to do it. Um, there are more modern ways of looking at incorporating those effects that would otherwise be needing to be rolled in uh, to um, uh, adding rules. Uh, and this is one area where a lot of games have really benefited from, um, you know, very earlier things like chip pull mechanics. Um, but, but even more recently with the advent of the card driven game or CDG mechanic, there's a lot of games that have, have uh, looked at taking Chrome out of the rule books and putting them into cards and having a very simple edition of a hand management or a card layer, which all gamers are familiar with. Um, to then bring in the effects that might otherwise be, you know, another five subsections of rules. Yeah, I'd add I'm a big fan of that personally. Um, I found that most people can handle a, a lot of complexity so long as it's presented in a way that they're familiar with. Cards definitely do a lot of that, especially if the card carries its own rule or own effect on the card. All right. I, with that, I think we'll go around the room and get any saved rounds or last questions from either the chat or people here uh, uh, with voice in, in the room. Gamator, Ardwolf, any uh, parting shots or thoughts? I thought this was very interesting. And I've been guilty of being in the playtest and not actually playtesting this game. So this is the first time I actually see it on the table. <laughs> well, and, uh, and Gage will, will say, you know, I, I like talking about war games as, as much as I, I enjoy, um, you know, playing them. I certainly enjoy playing them, but, uh, you know, the study of them is, is fascinating. And um, those of you that have been around the Hex Encounter community you know that that I, I've been around here a while and I, I was the community's, you know, original cheerleader and, and you know, I, I was the one that hopped onto Reddit and typed in all the things to set up the community. I, I just, I want us to get, you know, a better penetration of the hobby into, you know, the, the modern places where people discover uh, interests and, 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 and things like this. So, um, you know, this has uh, uh, been fun. I've, I've appreciated the, uh, the spur of the moment idea to get, you know, kind of a panel or Q&A uh, discussion on uh, a couple of these rule systems in next war. It's certainly a meaty thing and a lot of people are drawn to it by the subject matter, but, but are, are justifiably put off for it uh, because of the, uh, the rules, uh, the way the rules are presented. But there's a lot here uh, if, if you are willing to dive in and have some fun. Don't let the rules get in your way. Enjoy it. Have fun with it. Uh, you know, endeavor to understand them and to learn and to get it right. But if it's stressing you out, just go with it, right? And and uh, you know, uh, I, I, I you can quote me as saying, you know, there there's no such thing as as you know a, a bad day gaming, right? Just game, just just do it. So um, with that, uh, I'll uh, turn the mic over to uh, Gage, and then we'll wrap this up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first, thanks for having me. This was a blast, and I'd, I'd be happy to come back and do this anytime. I, I love dissecting games. Um, it's fascinating to see how all these things represent something in the real world, and if you have familiarity with it, if you do military ops research or anything similar, it's, uh, it's interesting to see how people approach how do you turn very complex things into something that can be done in an afternoon. Uh, the only other thing I would add is to, to build off of what Alex said, uh, there's... 
a, a I don't know if it's a, a single aphorism or truism from the tabletop role playing game community so much as a spirit, which is uh, the you just want to keep going. And TTRPGs is about telling a story. Here it's about having a battle. If you're bogged down in the rules the whole time, yeah, you're you're not having a battle. So the if, if that means that you only play it incrementally or you start with let's just set up some chits and see how they fight each other, whatever you got to do to teach yourself before you're comfortable to get going, I, I think is good. But this is again, I, I got to be really careful with my worth, words here. Even if it's bulky, it's straightforward. And once you realize how all the pieces play together, it's it's pretty straightforward to play. Yeah, just take the the uh, SOP and just go through the case one by one. Absolutely. That's true for most board games. Even if they have really complicated rules, you take the sequence of play and you slowly move your way through the sequence of play and things will actually make sense. All right. And with that, I'm going to thank all of you for uh, taking the time to join us live on the stream here and discuss Next War, the Next War series and in particular here the latest installment, Next War Vietnam. I do hope that we'll be able to turn this fireside chat <laughs> game table discussion into a a more routine feature here for the subreddit and the discord server um i enjoy doing this and if, if folks are interested in, in doing this i'm i'm willing to you know find interesting folks uh or if you would like to host the you know there's no password to this uh you know discord server right you're you're welcome to to host here as well uh just record it and share it for us so um with that uh this has been Alec, I've been joined by um, uh, co-hosting here with uh, my guest, Vice Roy Gage, and, and a number of people from uh, the Reddit's Hex Encounter community. Um, uh, in specific, Amator, I wanted to thank you for your, your, your consistent inputs and thoughts and experience in this system. Uh, for those of you catching uh, this on YouTube, uh, please do come by reddit.com uh, slash r slash hex encounter. Uh, Reddit's beachhead for tabletop uh, hex encounter based role gaming. With that, uh, signing off and have a good night, everybody.